you who are interested in Jeff and I talking about the year ahead. This actually happens every year um, in January at Brighton Bush Hot Springs, which is an amazing jewel of the uh, Northwest. It's about an hour out of Salem, Oregon, which is about an hour south of Portland, Oregon. And it's in the uh, Cascades, old growth forest, hot tubs, good food, and cosmic talk for an entire weekend. Jeff and I will be talking about 2013, along with doing the charts of each of the individual participants. This is our fifth year of doing uh, Fifth or sixth, yeah. yeah. And what we'll do on the weekend, after doing an overview of the year ahead on Friday night, Saturday and Sunday, we're gonna work with the birth chart of each one of the attendees. So if you have the opportunity of coming, you will definitely have your chart looked at and talked about by Rick and me in front of the group to help give you some ideas and strategies and ways of working with the year ahead in a successful manner. That's if there's a year ahead, because of course, <laughs> no astrology night on December, you know, the, the first Wednesday night of December um, in the year of 2012 would be worth its salt if we didn't remind you that the world ends for all the wrong reasons on the winter solstice on December 21st, 2012. Well, uh, yes, but yeah, if, yeah. If, for sure, but in case it doesn't end and we all make it to Brighton Bush, you can find out about it by going to stariq.com, that's S-T-A-R-I-Q.com, the website that Rick and I created. There's a link to information about the weekend workshop at Brighton Bush. And if you sign up and the world ends, there's no loss anyway. <laughs> but, you know, a, a number of people, of course, have been talking about this sort of end of the world business, which is not primarily an astrological interpretation at all. But I think what's helpful is for those of us who have any sort of consciousness, awareness, or hope of growing such for yourself or humanity, that let's make it a new world. What would you like in your personal new world? What would you like in our collective new world? This is a, a, a new year that we're looking forward to. The solstice uh, is a new season, so we have plenty of opportunities to take this tide which people are riding with ignorance and fear and put a little hope and intelligence in it and take it to some place a bit more interesting than simple despair. And although there may be a turnover in the long cycle of the Mayan calendar, the 5,125-year uh, great year, the fact is that most of the astrological um, uh, projections aimed at December 21st, or those you've probably seen on the internet with the three planets over the three pyramids, bullshit. That was supposed to be yesterday, day before yesterday, nothing happened. Um, the alleged alignment of the sun with the center of our galaxy on December 21st, 2012, is approximately two centuries off. off. Yeah, it's I close, mean, but, you know, a couple hundred years, from give the, or take. From yeah. the Earth's point of view, the center of our galaxy now is somewhere around 27, 28 degrees of Sagittarius, and it moves um, one degree every 72 years, so we're close to about 150 to 200 years away from the sun lining up with the center of our galaxy as is being thrown around. Now, there may be an alignment of the wobbling plane of the solar system with the apparent stationary plane of the galaxy, but that's not what most people are talking about. And in fact, that too, there's question. It's very difficult to fine tune cycles that last tens or hundreds of thousands of years and pinpoint them to one evening. It ain't gonna happen. And as Rick and I have been discussing now for quite some time, we are in the midst of a very significant astrological Absolutely. cycle. Absolutely. The square, the right angle between revolutionary Uranus and transformational Pluto, which began earlier this year in 2012, 
continues on and off through 2015. So we are in a wider period of time in which there's an extraordinary opportunity for transformation, which is more than simply the breakdown of the economy, environmental disaster, or other nasty and undesirable stuff. In fact, I, I heard a, a news item on NPR about the Voyager spacecraft, which has been out there for, I don't know, 20 or 30 years, and is now at the edge of the solar system. Uh, they don't know whether it's really quite hit it yet, or whether it will happen in the next couple of years or so, but it is the point at which the cosmic radiation coming into the solar system from stars outside of our system uh, meet the solar radiation. And what that suggests is we're at a breakthrough. We're at a potential point in human consciousness to go beyond the containers that we have lived in not only for our lives but for our ancestors lives as well and and also other discoveries very recently in the past weeks including water i mean abundant water on the planet mercury and organic matter on mars i i, I think that the metaphor of of this river of photons that they've discovered at the edge is, is, is part of a larger picture that you're describing of breaking out of the comfortable place in our individual lives and cosmically where we were and where we're heading. I mean, we are heading in some ways for the great unknown, and, um, and we'll come back to this again and again, not only tonight, but monthly, and that is as we move collectively, culturally, socially, politically, economically into this great unknown, we do not have control over all of those things, but we do have control over some of the things in our individual lives. And we do have control over whether we engage out of trust and love, or whether we pull back out of fear. And this whole thing about this 2012 end of the world on tw December 21st, although nothing other than another solstice, which is important, nothing else is happening astrologically on that day, I'm of the firm belief whenever you get more than a handful of people together thinking cosmic thoughts or thinking fearful thoughts, that creates its own ripple. So there may be import on this particular day because people from all over the planet are focusing their energy on this day and all I can say is that if you participate in that know that you can participate either out of fear or out of trust and love. Well said and you, you know every year on the winter solstice the Sun is moving into Capricorn which does feel like the end of the world <laughs> especially for Sagittarians which is we're what we all are now, a little bit. You know, regardless of what your chart is, what your signs are, we all experience collective changes together. So this month, at least until the 21st, we're all Sagittarians because that's where the sun is. And although we, we began by talking about longer cycles, whether it's the Mayan calendar or you're in a square Pluto, the way astrological patterns tend to work is that faster moving, shorter cycles trigger the bigger, longer ones. And if the world is going to change in a dramatic way, we've got enough visionary, Sagittarius, let's strap ourselves onto that rocket and ride it to wherever the hell it wants to take us this month to enjoy the experience and to expand our minds. Yeah, I, I think that that is really the case. Of course, the idea of strapping ourselves onto this rocket mm -hmm. and heading off into the sunset. This image of um, what was how I loved to learn, how I learned to love the bomb, Doctor Strange Love. Doctor Strange Love. Somehow, riding the rocket ship may not be quite as easy. Certainly, adrenaline rush creating, but it may not be as easy as it sounds. It sounds like a good idea but it's not without its pitfalls. Oh, absolutely. The pitfalls of, of Sagittarius, which is the half uh, horse, half archer shooting the arrow up into the sky, represents sort of that ride towards something bigger, towards the great beyond. And of course, the pitfall of that is where we're looking at the far end of the horizon, we may be stumbling over our own two feet. Now, there is a school of esoteric astrology. And in esoteric astrology, 
the Earth is the key ruling planet of Sagittarius. And I think what that suggests is, from an esoteric perspective, it's <coughs> necessary to have our feet solidly planted on the ground if we're really going to go far. If we're aiming at something nearby, if I'm aiming to hit this with an object, this nearby thing, I don't have to be very accurate to hit it. I don't have to be that grounded to hit it. But the further you aim, the more the error is amplified. So if we're going to be Sagittarian in any way, expanding our mind, expanding our ambitions, and having hope beyond reason, it doesn't mean that we can't also have some reason about where we are so that we can make the impossible come true. You just touched on an image that's very Sagittarian to me, and that is Sagittarius in the physical body rules the, the thighs. Um, for animals, it's like the horse that has, that can, you know, when it's galloping, when it's, when it's going far, a thoroughbred horse has that extension, the ability to go the long distance, which is what Sagittarius is. However, that same long distance runner, the, the ability to really reach farther, to reach for that distant star, as you said, is often that same Sagittarian person who can be very graceful when they're doing practice moves, can be the one that'll stumble around and walk into walls and be very clumsy with the local, with the details. And here we have the differential, perhaps, between um, Jupiter, which is um, Sagittarius's key planet, and Jupiter, Sagittarius is opposite Gemini, and Mercury is Gemini's planet. And so right now, what's really fascinating is that Jupiter is in the sign that's opposite. Normally, Jupiter is associated with Sagittarius. Jeff said um, that we are all Sagittarians now a bit, because we're in that time of year when the Sun spends its month in the sign of Sagittarius. But Jupiter, which spends a year in each sign, takes 12 years to go around once. Jupiter is as far away from the Sun as it can ever get, and it's in Gemini. And as Sagittarius likes the general principle, the big idea, going long, going far, Gemini is about the noise in our environment. It's about tying our shoelaces, not getting a rocket ship to the edge of the universe. And so I think that dilemma becomes part of the issue that is kind of brought up again and again this month. Yeah, that's a very good point. In traditional astrology, Jupiter is considered to be debilitated or weaker in Gemini. Why? Because it's about the big view and Gemini is about the trivia, the multiplicity of data so that Jupiter doesn't function as well. And this month, on the 10th, Mercury, Gemini's key ruling planet, the planet of details, moves into visionary Sagittarius, a sign in which it is traditionally considered to be debilitated or weakened. Now I think what this means is that, that calibrating our vision is the challenge. Nearsightedness and farsightedness. When do we pay attention to those things that are right in front of us, which Mercury and Sagittarius tends to overlook? When is it appropriate to step back and get the big picture view, which Jupiter in Gemini sometimes has difficulty doing? So it's almost as if we're, we're dealing with mental energy here. Mercury is lower mind, what we call fact-collecting, data-oriented mind. Jupiter is higher mind, a philosophy and principle, or long-range vision. And when Mercury goes into Sagittarius, I think it's very good you brought that up, Rick, that a major theme is going to be uh, making that calibrated adjustment between are we talking about something that's true for today, or are we talking about something that's a long-term goal or an ultimate truth? This also means be careful, not just in what you say, but in what you believe. Because Mercury and Sagittarius can make something trivial sound much more important than it is. And Jupiter and Gemini can take something really important and trivialize it.